Hello and welcome. This is the Tuesday episode of the 1904 Club, the Hull City podcast from the Hull Daily Mail. And we're coming to you after well, what ultimately was a really disappointing Easter weekend for Hull City. Two defeats um, and uh, ground lost in the playoff race. Burnsy's here, Fletch is here. And after his mammoth day yesterday, where I hope he was on at least time and a half, Prutz is here Never. as well. Prutz, how was yesterday in the uh, in the studio? It's good, good fun, very good fun. It's uh, it bizarrely it flew by, considering as you kind of coming up to going on air at twelve, the producer says, "Good luck, just the ten and a half hours to go." <laughs> when you go, <laughs> but bless him, he, he was he he did the whole thing with me as well, which probably that would have been the greater challenge, doing the whole day with me rather than actually doing the whole day. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's good. Some very very good games. Obviously, we're going to get on to. One in particular, or two in particular, over the course of the weekend. <clears throat> but um, yeah, it's a pleasure to call it a job in inverted commas. Burnsy, how are you? How was your Easter weekend? Yeah, I was. Um, I yeah went to the London International Ska Festival and went to see some blues. So I've, I've been on the pop this weekend, but I have looked at the and I use the word loosely uh, the highlights of City's two performances over the Easter weekend, it's not the time to be going the wrong way, is it? Wrong time to be going the wrong way. And uh, for me, I've been thinking this for a few weeks, actually, the whole is less than the sum of the parts at the club. And um, it's, uh, it's it, I, I don't know, and I, I'm not quite sure why, but um, I mean, and, and I checked Twitter and all that sort of stuff. People were banging around words like turgid, and boring on Friday. They were better yesterday, but ultimately they still lost. Not one in six, 20th in the form table over, I think, the last 10. And it ain't good enough, really, given all the expectation. Not good enough. Need to sort it out. Fletch, like myself, you were at both games. Um, we'll go back on to Friday in just a minute, but what's your overriding feeling of, of, of Easter for Hull City? Um, probably that I haven't felt so sick since I was a child and had too many Easter eggs over a weekend, <laughs> to be honest. Um, you, know on subject, you know, on that subject, can I let you into a little secret? I, I managed to stop at Morrison's fuel station yesterday on the way into Leeds and I picked up two Lind Lindor eggs, £1.75 each. What? Yeah, you know, the full, the full size Yay. gold. I could not believe, I couldn't believe that was before I got to Ellen Road. So it was probably that was like the, going to be the highlight of the game, wasn't it? Or the, the day. So yeah, 350 for two eggs that were probably like 12 quid at full price. I mean, wow. Anyway, Fletch, sorry, but I needed to drop that in because I, I, I had a feeling that yesterday that might be the highlight. And, and, um, it's that, that was too good. I mean, it was always going to go downhill after getting that. <laughs> <laughs> that was 15 quid. Secret I shopping podcast. <laughs> There's so many things we can do. We can do like off 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 a tangent from this podcast, you know, like Prutz's rutting stags and <laughs> um, God knows what else. Anyway, Flash, sorry, it was the you mentioned being sick on chocolate that that sparked me, piqued me interest in in me uh, my hall of Easter eggs yesterday. Makes me feel even more sick. I paid fifteen quid for the same box on Thursday from Saints, which just down the road. Quid. Yeah. Is My <laughs> yes. Right, football, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Get back to that. Friday, Friday complete write-off. Weren't good enough. Too slow, too pedestrian. Um, I actually thought last night they played really well. Um, mm. Definitely worthy of a point. Leeds in the last 10, 15 minutes rode out the storm of what Hull City chucked at them. Um, you always know when you go to Welland Road, as soon as the, their fan base turn on their team, you know something's wrong. We got the equaliser, didn't capitalise on it, wasted chances, um, which normally we would say on another day goes in, but there's a trend developing, which is most definitely concerning. Um, but I will chuck in straight away that I'm not ruling the club out of the playoff hunt just yet, and I've got some numbers to try and back it up to try and maybe spread some positivity in what has been a very negative few weeks. It's one of those, isn't it? I mean, we were just saying off air that... I I came home from the game on some, on Friday and I just felt it was a, an absolute gut punch. They were so bad, so flat. Um, and I, for me, I felt that any playoff hope there was probably, given the, the fact that everybody else won on that day and it was six points plus goal difference, they weren't winning games. 
I really felt like that that was a, a massive kick in the knackers. And then you go and play last night, and I thought they were terrific. I thought for for much of the game, they they were the lost. best side. Yeah, as you they say, Fletch, as you say, they um, they quiet in the crowd. One of my colleagues turned to me and said, who covers Leeds, and said, you know, I've not seen a team do this to Leeds for a long time. And I think, perhaps am I right in thinking, Sky put up a, a stat during the game that no team had had more possession at Leeds in four years than, than, than City had in that first half? That would sound about right. Does that yeah. end the Premier League, though? Because surely Man City have had more possession and there was... I think it was 67% at Unle- one point. I mean, unless it was a championship-based stat, bookending the, 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 the couple of seasons in the Prem, potentially. We're quite good at Elon getting stuff like that out to fit our narrative. <laughs> um, yeah, but I don't know. I mean, whether it's because I was slightly frazzled but after watching four games on the spin and, and looking at that. Um, possession, yes. Threat, no. Doesn't matter. The, the, I was reading through the tweets with regards to um, uh, what you'd put out, Bernsey, to to go fishing for for questions and stuff, which is always fantastic. We always get a good response to that one. Um, and we looked at it before the game. A game changer for Hull City can be Jaden Philogene. A definite game changer for Leeds is Somerville. There was a I think one tweet saying about him diving in the box. No, it was it was categorically a penalty, very clear penalty. You know exactly what he's going to do. If you don't know the way that Leeds go at the opposition inside the 18 but yard box you haven't done your homework it's as simple as that uh it was it was a, a definite penalty and they've got players that can change games L- let me put a bit of mitigation into it and a bit of perspective it's also several of the players that were terrible in the premier league that went down with i mean not even a whimper that that last few months they were they were stinking the place up mm. and then they come to into the championship after a bit of a slow start, and do what they've done. The, uh, a cynic says they should be. They should be doing that. Leicester City should be doing that. Ipswich Town are the outliers who were doing unbelievably well with players that were in League One last season. Leeds have got, ostensibly, a Premier League squad. So they should be beating Hull City, to yeah, be yeah, frank. Yeah. Um, they've got players in positions that um, can affect football matches. Now, they come at a price and a premium, and they're highly coveted. Hull City... Um, it's fitting that jigsaw together to create that whole picture. That's me paraphrasing a very well reworded phrase that Burnsy used with regards to the to the to the sum of, of the parts. But Fab, uh, Fabio scores a very good goal with a very good centre forward movement. But he's filling a gap, isn't he? He's not he's not uh, an out and out striker. Um, and w- without writing off what Liam's doing, because yeah. He's a passionate man. You saw that after the game. He was proud of the effort and the endeavour. Um, and you can dominate possession for as much as you want. Um, but in the end, it, the man, I mean, I think Leeds' XG was probably three times as much as City's in the end, was it? It was almost three. I think Le- uh, Hulls was just under under one. So it, it, you have the bo- seriously, lads, have the ball as much as you want. If you're going to not do anything with it, Leeds United will just sit there and go, fine, fine. We, we, we'll attack when we can and we'll finish you off when we can. That's the problem, Pruss, isn't it? And Burns, I'll come to you in just a second. That is the issue. Is for all that, and I said this to Liam myself last night, for all the dominance, for all the good play, the positive mm-hmm. play, the progressive play, and the way they got Ellen Road, it was Ellen Road was silent for long periods. They were frustrated. They only had two shots on target in the game. They didn't have any against Stoke. Um, and for... I, I think it's criminal that for a team that have got the attacking talent that Hull City have in their side to not create more. I, I, we'll come on to Jaden in a minute. I don't think he's been great probably since the Rabona goal against Rotherham, mm. which is quite a long time ago. It's, 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 you know, it's, Baz, you, sorry, sorry to put in, but you know, if you look at the goal, which is a very good goal and, yeah. and predominantly made by Tyler driving forward into yeah, the box, yeah. which wonderfully directs attack play. But in the in the moments before that, City are bouncing it around on the edge of the box. No one's no one's looking to take a shot on. No, You're on the edge of the eighteen yard box. No one's yeah. looking to take the shot on at all. It bounces around, bounces around, bounces around. Ends up fortuitously at the feet of Morton, who just goes, "Do you know what? I'm, I'm going to swear that he just says, sod it. Boom! I'm going in. I'm driving into the box, and I'm going to whip it back across. That's the, the Somerville penalty. Driving into the box, uh, engineering contact. It's 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 something that. I can absolutely see, and, and as, you, as as I said, you read the 
the Twitter thread with regards to questions coming into this. I can absolutely see the frustration completely because football's great and it, 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 when you dominate the opposition, when you control proceedings, but it's about being effective and keeping the ball in two thirds of the pitch and not um, exposing the last third of the pitch. It, I'm not saying it doesn't matter. And that's not, it's, it almost sounds like I'm taking, I'm not being condescending or anything, but because Liam's a far greater coach and a footballing analytical mind than I ever will be. But I can absolutely see you there and sit there with a fan, with your fan hat on and go, seriously, any chance of someone having a shot or, or, or moving forward or, or driving into the box, which again, like I said, Tyler did. Do you know what? Ball at the feet. There's a gap. I'm going to run into it. It can be a wonderfully simple game. They're not, that's making, it, but they're, they're not making it simple. And the stats back it up. A, a couple of people have sent stats. One was, um, I can't find it at the moment, but Nick says, here's slap bang the problem with our season. 501 accurate passes to Leeds 363, yet Leeds are the team with the most touches in the opposition box. You can't keep passing it sideways. Have purpose to get in the box. And for all the possession, they absolutely out-possessed Stoke and Leeds over the weekend. But it, was it two shots in two games over Easter when you're chasing um, the, the playoffs and promotion? Not good enough. Absolutely not good enough. We can dress it up all we like, but it ain't good enough. Can I have the and first the question is, dressing it Why? Up? Why? <laughs> yeah, I don't, Fletch, just one second. Um, yeah, I, I don't disagree with you, Virgil. I think, you know, the Stoke, I think we'd all agree, and, and Liam himself, and, and in fairness, like it or not, and, and whatever else, Liam on, on um, Friday, when he came in to, 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 to do his, his post-match press conference, um, and I always give him the floor and I always say, what well, you know, talk us through your feelings. How do you feel? Uh, and, and he was very blunt. We weren't good enough. We, we, we were well below bar. Uh, it, it didn't need the, it didn't need the, the, the angry treatment or, or anything like that. He, he offered up exactly what, what we all saw. If he'd have come into the, to the media conference afterwards and gone, I thought we played quite well this afternoon, we, we know this, that and the other, then you go, well, hang on a minute. Are you watching the same game? But Liam was very honest. Um, I think, I do think, I feel sorry for him in the sense that I, I, I think this, the way they're set up, he there's, there's a fundamental, and perhaps maybe you can help shed some light on this, but there's a fundamental block. You know, when you watch them in training, they're raining shots in from you know from all all sides. Um, even in the warm up, they're, they're not they're, they're okay, but then they get out there, and there's some kind of you know, fundamental issue that when they get in around the penalty area, they're always trying to take that. It, there was one the moment, second half at Leeds yesterday, when Tyler Morton breaks towards the penalty area and you think, go on then, go on, hit it. And he slides in, and he slides in Abdush. Oh, by the way, Prots, Abdush Omer. Um, right. Sorry about that. Um, and he Shit. slides in Abdush and he bends it wide of the post. And you, that was at one all, and you thought, that's a bit, that could be a big moment. Uh, but you, with Tyler's confidence, you think, just have a shot. Mm. And as you say, there were so many moments in that first half when they were knocking on the door, they get to the penalty area and it's like there's nobody in the penalty area. They, they come back out and Jaden tries to, you know, he tries one-twos. And you're thinking just, OK, there were a couple of other moments where he tried to get a shot away and Leeds blocked. And it was the same on Friday where Stoke blocked. But they're, they're so few and far between. Mm. Uh, Fletch, what, were you, what was your mitigation? Well... The, the only thing that I want to add into the mix, I know we're talking on a Hull City podcast, but we have to give credit to the way Leeds United defended, I think, last night as well. I thought they were very rigid and very solid, hence why they were going side to side. If you can't find space, then you're going to have to go sideways and you're going to have to keep the ball moving. That's the only thing I was going to add on that fact. Can't, can't defend the Stoke game for the same reason, mm. because Stoke just went into a low block for most of the game and then sucker punched, sucker punched us in the last quarter of the match and they couldn't come back from it. You know, so I've seen that so many times at home this season. It's the deja vu, and they've not solved the problem. He said an interesting. I had a listen to um, Mike White had a chat with him after the game on uh, sort of post Stoke, and Liam said we need to improve in terms of our attacking output, and uh, we need to improve in terms of the tempo of our play, and that's something we'll work on. And I now need to give the trust to the players to put it into practice, and that jarred with me. I now need to trust to give the trust to the players to put it into practice. Now I know I play with words all the time, but did he not trust them before to 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 do it? I, I found that I found that interesting. I may be in a, a, a you know 
a group of one on that. Mm. But why is he not trusted the players? And I keep coming back to it. That problem has been recurring all season at home. Mm. Why is it not being sorted out? Why can't they beat a, bl a low block or whatever it's called these days? <laughs> you know, you've brought all these clever players in, but why can they not thread a ball through and, and, and get in threatening positions? It's, you know, I'm sick of hearing him say the same things. The, He's the, sorted. The, the funny thing right. about that, Burns, is that, I'm, you, you, that statement, I think if I'm not reading too much into it or if, or if, if I'm misinterpreting it, when he's, that's a very nice way of saying it's the player's responsibility, I think. It's a bit, it's a bit, it's not quite management speak. I mean, it's literally management speak because the manager said this particular thing, but you know what I mean? Like that, that corporate jargon type rubbish. But I do, that, that to me sounds like his nice way of saying it in public that, look, we've given you everything in training. We've told you what we want. We've shown you what that team does. We know what you lot can do. So now when I say I need to trust you to do it, sorry, I need to kick you up the arse and say you've got to go and do it now because he can't play the game. That's I think that's what mm. that's my interpretation. But he can't put the shirt on and play the game for the players. So he's got to make sure that the players know that there's no stone unturned, that they've got all the tools they need to go and perform. And like you say, Stoke City, they didn't do that. Um, another team that's been at the wrong end of the table for such a long period of time. Um, and then with the with the with the Leeds game where it's possibly, and this is not casting aspersions on the application of the players, it's an easier game to get up for. With all due respect to Stoke City, isn't it? It's it's a packed house at Leeds. I can see again across Twitter the fans had a good time with whether you call it banter or just outright <laughs> hatred towards each other, going at each other. Um, I totally get that. Um, but to come away from it from from a, a, a points wise has been a disaster of, of, a, of an Easter weekend and, and kind of moving towards a slight bit, slightly hypothetical because the, these these um, instances and games obviously don't not necessarily happen chronologically. Bamford scores, it's 2-1. Mateo Joseph hits the post, it's 3-1. Somerville scores the penalty, it's 4-1. Dan James scores from 70 yards out, it's 5-1. Like I said, that is hypothetical because if you are 3-1 down, the goal is not up in the box trying to get a last-minute equaliser because you're already 3-1 down. You know what I mean? I, I totally get that. But but for Leeds' profligacy, they could have been absolutely home and hose. They, I mean, they could have seen out that last 10 minutes without bluntly getting really out of second gear, really. I mean, again, keep the ball for as much as you want. Leeds had better chances. And that is the fundamental problem, and that's something we've talked about, you know, certainly since the turn of the year, uh, in, in the fact that they, they, they aren't creating enough chances – uh, and they certainly aren't scoring enough goals. And I think I said it a couple of weeks ago during the international break after Norwich had gone sixth without City playing because of the Coventry's FA Cup game that I couldn't see them overturning that eight-goal deficit because I can't see... They don't score enough goals. They don't... Mm -hmm. You know, we can count on one hand the amount of games they've scored more than three um, this season. Uh, and that is that is an issue. And it's a real shame because, you know, like you, said, you touched on at the start, Burnsy, you know, they, they didn't win the game. And they played... But for all the nice football and all the all, all that positive stuff and pinning Leeds back and all, they didn't, as, as you say, uh, Prutz as well. They, Leeds, off, Leeds, you know, sat back in the game and were, you know, were quite passive in the game. But when City made a mistake, Leeds are in and created a, 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 created a decent chance. Whether you know, Bamford should have scored, that was a great chance. You know, they got in down the left. Giles lost his man, lost Bamford, should have scored. Obviously, Joseph should have scored. Um, you know, there were one or two other nearly moments and Leeds created moments. City didn't create any moments. But for me, last night can happen. You, you're going away from home against a team of 19 games at home unbeaten, 115 of those. That can happen. And you, you take your medicine last night. I come back to Friday. Friday is the, gut, is the gut punch because Friday was the opportunity to find a way to win a game at home, to get a result, to just find a way to win that game. And they never, ever, ever, from the minute they kicked off, never looked like it was going to happen. And that was the, that was three points dropped against, you know, a fairly, Stoke have got good players, but they were, you know, they, they were 19th in the table. So let's, come on, let's be fair. That was, a, that was a real missed opportunity. And that one, that Stoke game is one in a long list of home games this season where they've dropped points. Not necessarily playing as badly as that. You know, me and Liam have referenced the Birmingham game on more than one occasion. For 85 minutes, they were brilliant against Birmingham, but they were only 1-0 up, never got the second goal, and then were punished. You know, they were awful against Swansea, 
lost. Awful against Stoke, lost. Yeah, Burnsley, go ahead. I was. I, I want to come back to the word trust, um, and I'm interested in, in terms of what Prutz has said, but what, what do you feel? Do you feel he... he I come back to it. I, I know... Uh, I now need to give the trust to the players to put it into practice. What they've been doing before, am I over-egging it, over-analysing it? Go on, if Brian. I can, well, let me try and uh, an example that I'll use, and it was on a different podcast. I remember an ex-player, it was, I think it was Clark Carlisle who said it. So when Clark Carlisle was at Burnley, Eddie Howe came in. And before, they'd had Brian Laws as manager and just played the same system to get results, yada, yada, yada. But what Eddie Howe did was he put his own system in place, then took a step back, saw what the players were getting out of it, and then he made his changes. So look at how many players we've brought in in January. Seven, I think it is. Seven. Big stars, yes. Big stars who've had to gel together and we haven't seen enough goals from them. So maybe from that level of trust, he's now saying, right then, this system hasn't worked. Do I need to tweak things for the players to play in a certain way and give them the trust to go, do you know what? If someone said... I'm not saying that they disagree with Liam, but what I'm saying is if they think they can do it differently or try something different that they haven't done before and give them that licence, you've then got both sides of the coin. If one way hasn't worked and then they try a different way, then you've got a problem because there's obviously something tactically which isn't working. I think so they are, Yeah, I know what you're saying, Flash, and I think they are, what you make is valid, they are so structured in, in how they are coached and the information they are given and every. Everything that Liam does is planned to the nth degree. And you'll know this perhaps from speaking to him at length. Um, mm. It is so choreographed, even down to when they lose the ball and in certain areas of the, of the pitch where they have to be and where certain players have to be, certain players have to make runs. And that can that can be, at times be quite rigid, can't it, I suppose? And, and maybe the players you know, need to break up, at times, find a way to break away from that, that, that rigid stay, if you like. Perhaps? Yeah, I mean, I'm not. It's a funny one, isn't it? Because it's not. There's a, there's a, a youthfulness to the team, but it's not a young team in the sense that it's anyway callow or shy or, or timid, is it? it? It's you've got players in there that can really express themselves. It would be bizarre to think that Liam would come across a certain way, yet set a culture in a football club and in a starting eleven which um, suppresses. Uh, that that ability to be able to express themselves, wouldn't it? Whether well, it's the players, just down. already spoken. Of, the thing is, though, that, that's it because the players have always said, "Oh, we, we've got." You know, Jade has, has said this before. We, we, he gives us freedom to express ourselves. Well, they then, well, then there you go. Where, where, as ever in this situation, and when results have been like this and performances have been like this, there's one man that has to come out and shoulder the burden, and it's going back to potentially what Fletch said. I can't remember whether we were on air or not, but. Um, the, it's the players then. But has he got a bunch of players that can perform under pressure? Because they are under pressure. Liam's under pressure. Liam strikes me, and has always struck me, he's a very ambitious man who, who's, um, who, whose ambition does potentially want to push him into the top level, whether that's the top level with Hull City, time will tell, whether it's with someone else, time will tell, whether it's abroad, we shall soon see. Um, but if you are, as I said, as a coach, doing, from the sounds of it, doing absolutely everything you possibly can and your team isn't performing, then the blame lies solely in the middle of whether you've got the right place from a recruitment point of view and you can motivate them. And then the actual performance of the players. But the, the, I saw a finger pointed at Fabio Carvalho as well. He has not been as good as we thought he would be. That's, that's, that's not rocket science. Jaden set standards that he hasn't got back to. Um, Ozan Tufan can affect a game. Does he do it often enough? No. The newer players that have come in haven't set the set the place alight because we talked about Ohio being in the in the team on the bench, off the bench. Regardless of having to learn the new system or the new surroundings, if you're playing well, mate, in training and in games, you're in the team regardless of how how long you've been there. If you're there two minutes and you and you're banging goals in, you're in the team. Billy Sharp, we don't know what the situation is with Billy, whether it's not fitting into the system once again, whether it's a case of the match fitness. I buy him. Con exactly. Con Conley's another one. What uh, is, is he as effective as a striker should be? And by striker, I mean scoring goals. No, he's not. But you can, you look at, is the midfield as creative as it needs to be? No, it's not. No, it's not. Now, 
again, when we're talking about what's happened over the weekend, um, Hull City as a squad, I would say, has better players just about than Stoke City. Now, that may be a bit of a stretch considering what the gap is in between them, but Stoke City have got some really experienced footballers that as a collective just haven't performed. They've not performed since they came out of the Premier League, not finished in the top half of the Championship since they got relegated from the Premier League. Talk about treading water. I mean, and they still might not be safe. They may even be a League One club next season. You don't know. Leeds United have a fundamentally better squad of players than Hull City, and they should do. They're in the Premier League last year. They can pay more money. They can spend more money. That's just the way things are. So it, it comes to the point where, as much as Liam has really looked after his squad. Yes, he will be honest when they've not performed. But this is, this is like I said, it's partly the blame of the manager because he assembles a squad and the people that put the squad together. It's the players' performance. If, if I'm trusting the players to go and express themselves. They're not expressing themselves. It's very easy. And I'm saying this tongue slightly in cheek because I've not played football for a very long time. I've not played in the Championship for a very, very long time. Piece of, oh, this one. Passing sideways in front of a Leeds team that will just stand there. I'm 42. I could probably still do that now. The, the the money, the creation, the the jeopardy in the game, the big bucks goes to the people that can change games. Leeds pay a lot of money for players and give big wages. They've got players that can change games and they will probably be in the Premier League next season. So wh whether it's you blame the recruitment, whether you blame um, the chemistry, the team not being quite right, whether you go back to Burns's point of getting the right people at the right time. If you want a striker that's got to replace Liam Delap. I've got a lot of time for Billy. He's been a wonderfully successful footballer, way better than I ever was. He's not a like for like for Liam Delap at all. And if you want a Liam Delap type, go and get a Liam Delap type. Don't go, oh, we'll, we'll try and change it a little bit. Get what works. Buy what works. Recruit what works for your team and how you want to go about it. And if at the end of the season you can turn around and say, as a manager, I did my bit, you lot didn't perform, and so be it. You change the squad. Mm. Go on, right, just a quick question. For, just, is, it, is he under pressure? No. I think, I think he's under pressure. Yes, in the sense that he's a, he's a championship manager, so by definition, he's under pressure and he's expected to win promotion. Uh, I think they are ahead of where they thought they would be back in the summer, but then they've been able to sign players in January. Carvalho and Zorori are two I'm, I'm looking at, and probably Giles as well. Uh, the, those three players they've signed that they, they probably weren't expecting to get that level, uh, but. Zaruri isn't for me not really done it. Yeah, okay, he scored a goal at Southampton and a, a terrific strike against uh, against Leicester, but I don't think he's been anywhere near his his level. And potentially his him coming in as and seeing Jaden change size is maybe impacted on Jaden, and that's hypothetical and you know we that's just speculation. But it, watching it, Jaden's gone off the boil massively recently. Um, Carvalho. Do, do been... you think, Baz? Sorry to put it. So, you, back to recruitment, chap. Sorry, I'm, I feel like I'm talking a lot. And please feel free to tell me to shut no, up. That's what you're here but for, mate. That's what the, the, I know. Well, I mean, you, 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 I was going to say you don't get out for now, but you quite obviously do get a lot for now on this particular podcast. <laughs> um, the, the, when you look at the recruitment and the players that have come in to the side, Zorori, did you know anything about him before he had a decent season at Burnley? No. Fabio Carvalho had a decent season at Fulham, then he was off. Wasn't he? Yeah. You know anything about Ozan before he came in? Well, you knew that he'd, he'd performed well for Fenerbahce in Turkey, but obviously had his difficult spell at Watford. Yeah. Jaden, uh, 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 on his kind of Tarif route up to, up to, yeah, exactly. Liam Delap, different no. player, looks a different player in the whole city shirt. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Aaron Connolly, obviously, we know where he's been. I, I've, have Hull City assembled a group of players that have Bundles there, and bundles it. and bundles of A, experience and B, high output. Have they bought players that have had purple patches in a season, half a season, with good teams and gone, well, we'll have you? We'll take a risk. So are you seeing players that this is their level, that in other places, something about that environment got the best out of them? Manuel Benson potentially be another one at Burnley with regards to the interest that Hull City had in him as well. Is that is that is that what we're seeing? Like I said, it's not me casting aspersions on the application or the ability of the players, but ha have you got players with banks and banks and banks of experience that you can go? Do you know what? Most most weeks we'll have a seven or eight out of you. You'll give us the odd nine, fantastic, because you can draw on what they've what they've had before they've been a whole city player. I think you raise a fair point. Go on, Fletch. 
I think, yeah, and I think looking at what they've brought in, they have tried to cover both bases. They've tried to cover the basis of ability and they've tried to cover the experience. The experience being Billy Sharp. The thing, and I want to say this in a way that isn't too critical, obviously, with my connection with the club, but what I will say is this. When you look at the players that they brought in, Connolly, obviously, incredibly well connected to Liam Rossini through Brighton. Liam Delap was in Derby's under-18s under Justin Walker's stewardship. Then you've got players who have come in with the the tag of they've been there and done it in the championship. But have they been there and had to I'm trying to think of the best? Have they had to be there and you know sweat it out? Have they had to go through this six, seven, eight game run where the backs have been against the wall, the pressure's all on them, you know, because that is a difference. And I think some of the players that have really risen this season and we've heap them with praise of people like your Alfie Joneses, your Louis Coyles and your Regan Slaters. They were under pressure in League One when quite ridiculously, in my opinion, people were still calling for Grant McCann's head when they were sitting top after losing to Ipswich Town and people still wanted Grant McCann gone. So I don't really want to entertain the question of is Liam under pressure because I feel at this point in time, A, who are you going to get? B, you're ripping everything up at the end of the season and starting completely all over again. And you know, back him. You know, I don't think there's anyone who's got more emotional connection than Liam Rossini at this moment in time. And the simple question is, for people who disagree with me, is who do you go and get? Yeah, who do Fletch. you go and get that's going to have out. A, it's a great shout, yeah. Fletch. Fletch, for me, he, he's under pressure in the sense that he's, a, as I said earlier on, he is a, he is a manager in the championship and that brings its own pressure. Um, I think he's, I think if you look at where the football club have come from on and off the pitch in the last year, I think they've made tremendous strides. Um, I think you've got a style. I think you've got a style of play that, that is working to an extent. I think it needs developing. I think you know you, you you look at Ipswich and you look at how Ipswich play under Kieran McKenna and that you know swashbuckling style. You know, I think that's. I think a lot of City fans that I speak to that come and talk to me are frustrated because they see Ipswich having been in League One forever have come up with Kieran McKenna and are playing, largely with their League One squad, are playing a really open, expansive, attacking style of play, scoring, you know, I, I saw a stat earlier on, I think they've conceded Ipswich about the same amount of goals as Stoke, but I think have scored 46 more, um, which tells its own story. And I think that is the frustration that... Ipswich's a... front line is better than Hull City's. Caden yeah. Jackson, Sam Morsi, Luongo behind the front three, Connor Chaplin, Omari Hutchinson, Kiefer Moore... Even though the bulk of that is a, uh, when we mentioned Ali Al Hamadi, didn't we, in, in the January transfer window? So, want to take a bit of a even, punt. Even more was mentioned as well. Na- Nathan Broadhead as as well that came on and scored. West that Queens has and, and and whether whether that whether that's something a tough thing for a City fan to get their head around. That's a better, way better attacking unit than than um than what Hull City have got. Jeremy Samiento comes on, scores a winner. Be- better been options. Been better. Time, Whether that's to do with Kieran, Kieran's managed at Spurs, Manchester United, of course. He's done a cracking job at Ipswich. He's probably got more experience just about under his belt than Liam has when it comes to dealing with players and the the calibre of players that he has in in his in his managerial journey. He's been managing for nigh on twenty years. Kieran is a is a very very yeah. good boss, and that wh- whether wh- whatever the aspirations or the ambitions are or the or the or the kind of a self-awareness of what Hull City is as an entity. Ipswich, yeah, that's a team that's it might be it might be a, a, an ex League One team, but it's it's a far more potent attacking unit, isn't it? Yeah, I, well, I, I, don't, I absolutely agree. And I think just coming back onto the what Burns said about pressure and, and what have you, um, you know, I think I think Hull City need a period of stability. I think if they don't get in the top six, which Based on current form, they won't do. Let's, I know, Fletch, you're going to come in, in a bit, and we can all try and look at the positives and think, well, there's, you know, there's, if they can win a couple of games, they might be back in it. Based on current trajectory, they are not going to get in the playoffs because they're not winning football matches. So that is a fundamental problem. Um, but even if they don't get in the top six, what I don't want to see is their season to tail off. And then for, I mean, they're, they're tenth now, which with the squad of players he's got, seems ridiculous. But I don't want it to fall away. Uh, I, I, and I, st- I still think Liam is, is is going in the right direction. He's a young manager. Yes, he's made mistakes. He's made mistakes on the job. Um, and that is, you know, when you employ a, a manager and give him his first job, he's going to make mistakes. You know, David Moyes has been around since forever 
and mm. makes mistakes. So he, he, when you are employing a, you know, and I remember having a, a conversation with Azure right back at day one when he appointed him, and I said to him, you, you know, you, you, you're going to have to accept that when you appoint a rookie manager, you give him his first job, he's going to make mistakes, and he's going to make mistakes in full view of twenty four thousand people and the wider the wider football public, and that's what Liam has done throughout this season. And I think when he sits down and reflects on the season as a whole, he will realise that, well, you know, maybe in that game I was a bit too pragmatic or a bit too conservative and maybe I, maybe that, that game there, I, I could have done this differently and could have changed that. If sports and maybes, but I, I still, you know, they're still going in a really, in a really good direction. And if they do miss out this year, it's not the end of the world and we shouldn't rip it up and start again. We should look at actually, they put the building box, blocks in place. They will be better for this experience next year but it will come down to recruitment in the summer, Burnsy, you're waving vigorously. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What happens if they finish outside the top 10? That's failure, isn't it? I think so it is. Yeah, I think it's good for that, for anybody. I'm, listen, I'm, I, I asked the question, is he under pressure? I didn't, I didn't offer a viewpoint as to whether he is or not, but I just think the nature of the thing is he should be. Because, and I know what Prox is saying about it switching everything like that, but it's relatively. This is quite an expensively assembled squad. Yeah. Or, oh, very much you so. Know, yeah. You, 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 they're 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 losing a lot of money a month in terms of the way they funded the squad and everything like that. And ultimately, if you don't make the stated objective, which was the playoffs, but it's difficult. I accept that. But what happens if if they don't make the top ten? You know, the questions need to be asked. I'm not saying. It needs to change because he's a young manager. He's learning his trade and everything like that. But the question still needs to be asked. The discussion needs to be had because that's the nature of the beast. So for me, he is under pressure. And didn't you pick up on something with an interview with Mike White post Leeds, Bas? Yeah, said? he mentioned his future a couple of times in in, in with Mike last night, uh, which I thought was was quite interesting. But I. You know, it's understandable. Liam is Liam is only human, uh, and I think, given the expectation at the football club, you know, Ajun and, and Tan have, have both spoken about, um, you know, playoffs. I did an I did an interview with Tan out in Turkey like, only what a couple of weeks ago, and Tan spoke about the home form, how it wasn't good enough and needed to improve, um, but they were happy with the trajectory of, of, of things. Uh, but I, I I I do think Liam is 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 going to feel it. And he is going to feel that sense of disappointment because, you know, they've, they've had so many opportunities. Like I said, the Leeds game, that can happen against a team of that quality um, in that atmosphere. You make a mistake, you're going to get punished. That can happen. There have been too many Stoke games this season at home where the crowd have, have, have been flat because the performance on the pitch has been flat. They've let themselves down and they, they've either not, they've either lost or, or, they've, or they've drawn games they should have won. And I think Liam is, is naturally, at this stage of the season, feeling that sense of you know we could we you know we all want the top six we all feel we've got the quality to get in the top six but we could miss out here and that is a very real possibility and he will know you know he's got a really good relationship with the owner um but he will he will know that this is football and if, if they suddenly drop to 13th and finish 13th you know Ajun and Tam will be rightly asking questions and going well hang on a minute you know you've got you you, you know You've been six top six for the majority of the season. Yes, you've gone up against some some big clubs with big budgets, but you've been in there. We've given you January, you know, um, players like Carvalho and Zorori, and and, and Jade, but Jade has gone off the ball. We've maybe not got the best out of these players. What's happened? And that will be, uh, re, they are reasonable questions to ask any manager of any football club, particularly when you you, you spend Christmas and you start a New Year's Day sick from the table, and if you end up finishing tenth, eleventh, twelfth. That is, they are fair questions, particularly and the and Liam's put pressure on himself by saying, "Well, April, you know, March, April time is when I think the pitches are getting better. I expect this team to peak. This this team will peak, you know, in April." Well, he's got seven games now to 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 to, to, to prove that that theory. Stoke again, the Leeds game they played really well, didn't create enough. But it is the Stoke game that I keep coming back to is the one that has just killed, has completely popped the the excitement balloon. Go on, Fletch. Right. I just wanted uh, one thing that I think we we haven't even touched upon in this discussion, but we we discussed it back in Norwich and back in January when we played Norwich. When Norwich came to the MKM Stadium, 
David Wagner was probably one, two games away from losing his job. Yes. Now, if we if we if we'd beaten them that night, where would Norwich be now? It's the world of hypothesis. But what I want to bring in is some numericals, just to try and you know, um, just to give some perspective of the situation, because obviously we're very passionate and obviously we want the club to do well. So in comparative seasons, I've looked at the last three seasons. So Hull City, six points off the playoffs with a game in hand, right? Last season, Coventry, ninth, three points back. Everyone had played the same. So if Hull beat Coventry, same position. Borough took five points from 15 when they were sixth in the table, fell out of the playoff places in the season before. Season before that, Bournemouth, third to sixth, six points from 15. Swansea, five points from 15. They were in the playoff places, stayed in them because of the gap that had merged. So, And then Forrest in 2019-20, seven points, got beat by Stoke on the final day of the season, I think it was, and they fell out of the playoff races. So, sorry, Baz, but... What I'm trying to say is, <laughs> yes, we, we have to concentrate on ourselves and we have to beat the teams that we've got left, but it's by no means, in my opinion, as done and dusted as people are making it out to be. I genuinely think that there is still a very realistic chance. There is, and I think uh, there is a chance, and, and, and they are only six points off with that game in hand. Um, what I, I'd be interested to know, Prost, so they've got seven games left mm-hmm. with the, 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 where the things are at. I think they need five wins. What, what what are you thinking from that? Yeah, that feels about right. But then you're looking at the type of form that for consecutive potential victories there that City haven't shown all this is season of league. Which is that it's like when you see, it's like when you suddenly look at the bottom of the table and you're asking teams to put together kind of promotion chasing form. Oh, they need to win these. Well, no, the, they haven't and they won't because that's what they've done for for forty odd games already this season. So I think you're right. I, I think. The the and some great numbers and very perspective um, creating numbers from Flex there, mate. They're, they're absolutely bang on. And Coventry is a great example of getting n- that nearly but not quite. And a manager that has had a lot of time and a lot of patience put in him and a lot of trust, Mark Robbins, and has done categorically a wonderful job, hasn't he? But I was speaking to him earlier on this season, and with the, with a new ownership, his his benchmark is the playoffs. So what happens to him if they don't make the playoffs? You, you don't know. I mean, because loyalty only goes so far. And potentially Liam is talking in a way because he understands what the immediacy of football is, isn't it? Who who has several seasons to build? Not many. Hopefully Hull City is a, a different beast. Maybe it's a bit of a throwback of giving a manager time to work out how he wants the best to get how he wants to get the best out of his squad, which which then maybe maybe then makes this a hypothetical conversation when you're talking about it next season when they're flying high in the league. Uh, I think the frustration, going back to Burns's point and your point, Baz, about t- playing a-, a game such as Stoke is, I think you take away Southampton, Leicester and Leeds because of their financial muscle, whether that's going to come and bite one of them on the arse very shortly, we shall soon see. Um, because, as I said, as a cynic, those teams should be at the top. Ipswich Town, of course, being the outlier. And what Carlos has done in work with West Brom in very difficult circumstances off the pitch has been wonderful. But the rest of it then becomes a bun fight. So then if City were in the top six and do finish outside of the top six in the top, outside of the top ten, then I think you, you are well within your rights to, to ask questions. You can debate all this. I totally get that we're talking about people that we know and, and there's, the, there's the personal element to it as well. But we're talking about it in purely professional terms. You can ask questions. You don't have to then say, I think the manager should do one or it should be X, Y and Z. But you can absolutely ask questions because the team that ends up at the top of the table are the most consistent. Um, they're the ones that have been reliable enough to get through games, have been trusted to use that terminology, Bernsey, been trusted to do the job and have got the job done with said trust because they've performed. So when that's where the frustration comes from if you're a City fan, killing games off, seeing teams off that you really should be beating, again, in inverted commas, but just absolutely showing once again what the championship is. Very, very, very hard to get out of because you play a team that's been tripping over its boots for two-thirds of the season, suddenly gets near the end of the season, they see the dotted line and they're almost going to fall over it and then start going through the game. QPR. Yeah. QPR knocking people over left, right, centre when they look down and out and terrible. So it's it's not beyond the realms of possibility that City would find themselves outside of the top six. The good thing, going dovetail into Fletch's numbers, Coventry lost, Norwich lost, Preston lost. That's that, that's what you say off the back of a, of a of a crap Easter. There's no other way of saying it. 
the estimate of positives from the Leeds performance, you lost both games. Doesn't matter. That's that's two less games to your total. Now it's this mini league of getting into the top six with these last few games. Go on, Benji. Yeah, for me, the 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 one thing I think personally that might see him still make the playoffs. And I, I, Fletch, great stats. And perhaps I accept it's the championship. Mm. Not everybody will be consistent. Dog eats dog, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. When you think the opportunity's gone, the opportunity opens up. I think if they get Liam Dilap back for the last five games, they might have a chance. Mm. That, and coming on to what you said. I, I, I don't think so. Because, you know, they've, they've, they've not won in six. And it's... You know, the, the mathematicians and the optimists are answering the phones in the clutching at straws department. The realists are looking at the form, thinking don't score enough goals, home form's poor, it's, and they've had opportunities to change it, and they're not changing it. That's that's the thing. You're not seeing an improvement in the home form, and you should have done by now. Okay, I've, would be my yeah, point. But I, I accept they've still got a chance of making it. I wouldn't but, write them off completely. But, but Bernsie, you're absolutely right, because hopefully when you do chat on things like this, you've got broadly the same direction, but you've got your own opinions on it, haven't you? And we're all coming from different aspects and different kind of points of view. And, and again, if you get... I mean, and this is this is a by the bar, right? If you get stuck into kind of Twitter threads and, and read reactions and all that, you hear every single thing because it's just a, a shouting match and everyone's, this is what I think, this is what I think, this is what I think. And I, that's what Twitter is. It's fine. But... It's you, inflated, the, the, in my opinion. Exactly. But the, the different opinions on here are absolutely needed. Burns's question of, of, of what is deemed success or failure and what you should ask of this squad is absolutely pertinent and totally correct because on paper where football's not played, it, it it looks to be the perfect setup. Owner, director of football, manager, all get on like a house on fire, all seemingly very um progressive and productive in the in their relationships. Liam from the outside looks like he's asked for people and he's been given people. Um the owner understands the connection between the city and the fans, the club and the fans. Um, he does very nice things from a PR perspective, and I, I'm not trying to sound too cynical on that because I think he's doing a wonderful job. Um, and you've got a manager that ticks a lot of boxes and a squad that ticks a lot of boxes. So then Burns's point is, so then why isn't it happening on the pitch? Which is that that's so we're all I can dress it up in I don't know. 15 years of playing football, 10 years of fanning around talking about it. I've got no idea. They've got good players with a good manager and a good owner. Why aren't they in the top six? God knows. Well, that, that's, so that's where that magic and the mystique of football comes into it because something's got to click. And again, I'm sorry if you're listening to this and you want absolute answers and categorical insight. Sometimes... You can't put your finger on it. And I'm well beyond Burns with this. I'd be sat there with a City top on if, it was, if I was a City fan going, Christ almighty, lads, any chance? Stoke have been terrible for, for all the time they've been in the champ. You should be beating these. Why aren't you beating them? And, oh, it's this and it's that. No, no, none of this stuff, none of the chat. Can you just go and beat them, please? Just go and beat them. That's, that's what you're there in that City shirt for. And I totally, totally get it. I can't offer you any bigger explanation than that other than something needs to click and fast. Speaking of needing to click and fast, um, time is running out then for Hull City. Seven games to go, three games in a week coming up, starting with Cardiff away on Saturday. Fletch, you and I will both be down in South Wales. Liam was very bullish after the Leeds game. We have to go there and win. Yeah, you, you, you can't afford not to. I know I've been speaking about how like point deficits and all this stuff, trying to be quantitative, but it's like what Prutz, Bernsey and yourself have been saying, you know, it's sink or swim time for, for the club. You have to win this game to restore that confidence. You can't buy confidence off a shelf. You know, you can't... Um, at the end of the day, I still am in the, in this position of... I, I, I still have that belief that if they can get into a, a strong commanding position where they go 1-0 up early, they, they, they can go on and win a game of football. Yes, we haven't seen it enough, but it's there. The quality is there, but... It's those little, maybe mental details as well. Cardiff are almost in that territory where they don't have anything to play for anymore. So they're going to be... Dangerous, doesn't it? Say that again, sorry. 
the trouble is at this time of the season that does make those sort of teams dangerous. I mean, yeah. well, not, any game, I think any game's dangerous. I, I think any game at this point is dangerous, Baz, because out, didn't QPR beat Burnley last year at this point in the season yeah. when Burnley were absolutely flying? And I, I, we can pick games and examples. I could do that, you know, all day, but it don't make a difference. At the end of the day, we've got to look after ourselves now and make sure that, as people have been alluding to, take the chances. That's what it boils down to at the end of the day. And the players and the players will know that. They'll just be as frustrated as we are that they are scoring. Jaden, yeah, Jaden, Jaden, Jaden Philogene's had 30 shots in a row not scored. He, was, he must be banging his head against the wall wondering, why have I not scored? He had two great chances against Leeds from really difficult positions. You know, sometimes it, <laughs> they need a bit, you know, there's all cliches of we need a bit of luck, this, that and the other, you know, and... <sighs> As long as it, as long as they win, I'm not bothered. Honestly, we could have they could have a thousand passes, have one shot and score. Go on, Bernsey. Hey, why, why do you think Cardiff are out of it? They they can go above City with a win on Saturday. I know they played a game more, but if I'm sat in the Cardiff dressing room thinking, you know, I'd be saying, lads, look, other teams above us are, are not showing any consistency. We've got six games to go. We're um, eight points off the last playoff place. Hull are above us. We can reel them in. Let's go above them, and then we'll we'll go again. I think it's a really tricky game. Remind me, where are they in the table? Cardiff eleventh to City's tenth, aren't they? Eleventth, but I yeah. Hull may be in that position points, as well. But if two, had, two, two, two points, points behind City, that they, they win, they get okay. They played a game more. They 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 go above. City, unless I'm reading the table wrong. If there was more games left, if if there was more games left, then I would agree with you that Cardiff still have a chance. But I think it's the case of they've got too much traffic to pass. I know it's a one extra team, but one extra team makes a significant difference. But by the end of Saturday, they could be above that extra team. Yeah, yeah, and then and then and then we could be spinning it round and saying that whole city, if results don't go our way with six games left, nine games, there's not enough time to re um you know rebuild and break that deficit. I think what we can in the last chance saloon. I think if City were to go to Cardiff and get beat on on Saturday, you'd, you'd you'd expect the gap then to the playoffs. You'd expect one of Preston, Norwich, and Coventry to probably win. That that gap could then be nine points. Yeah, okay, we can keep harping on about game in hand, but I'm always somebody at this stage of the season will go points on the board rather than mm. games in hand. Um, they, they've got to go and win. Look, you can. Nobody else is going to do it for them. Nobody else is going to going to going to do X, Y, and Z. Hull City have got to go and beat Cardiff and tick that off and see where they're at. See where the table... You are now needing snookers. You are now needing teams like they did yesterday to drop points. And then if, if, if you can hope that Norwich and Coventry drop points, Preston as well, then you, 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 you've you got Middlesbrough at home. The concern for me, and I've said this before, is is, is at home. I've, I've got full confidence that this team can go to Cardiff and win the game. And I think they will. My, my worry is, is, is then... Middlesbrough at home next Wednesday uh, and then QPR at home next Saturday. They are the two games that worry me because of their home form. Then They don't look like winning football matches at home. The Leicester, Leicester game accepted. Um, th- th- they're in no kind of form at home and there's, there is clearly an issue. The fans aren't confident. The players are, are struggling with playing at home and finding a way to break teams down. The only hope there is that Middlesbrough, with how, how they can play, they, they try and come and play and that might lend itself to, to, to Liam, Liam Settle but yeah I mean they, they can still do it and that is the message they can still do it Liam said to me off the record before we went we went live last night you know I'm not giving up it's still on I can we can still do it or I think his exact words were all still to play for and there is mm-hmm. but they've got to start winning football matches that is the long and short of it Prots yeah <laughs> again statistically I've I, 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 I... Burns' point of, of Cardiff and what they can do. Look at some of the results they've had in recent weeks. Yes, was a couple of defeats before that Coventry game, but that they, they're they capable of, of not necessarily causing an upset because it'll be tough, be really tough um, with regards to what City needs to get from it. Yeah, yeah, mathematically, it's still a possibility. It absolutely should be a priority. I I, I get the sense as a manager, there's and, and again, knowing him like I do, there's no sense of it being all doom and gloom, because it can't be. The great thing about football is it's always a few days and then you've got another game to put things right. Um, but as we said, uh, it's the running out of games to be able to do that. Um, Norwich have got Ipswich, Coventry taking on Leeds, Preston uh, face Watford, a, a real spread of different challenges for the teams in and around the playoff places. So I've been intrigued to see where it all sits 
at tea time on 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 Saturday because then then do we get a clearer a clearer view potentially? And we, we sat here going into the Easter weekend saying Stoke had to be a must win, and then uh, you take what you get from the Leeds game. So we we we're, we're now sat relatively in the same position going into the weekend saying, well, we've got a bit Cardiff. Time will tell. And um, it's a test of metal. It's a test of quality. And, and if they come through it, then suddenly that poor Easter is something of a blip and you're heads down to try and get in the top six. But that's the thing. We could be sat here on Monday, you know, having seen City win at Cardiff, you know, Norwich lose to Ipswich and Coventry against Leeds. And suddenly you're like three points off the top six again with a game in hand. And you go, well, that... You know, it's back on now. You've got six games to go. One mm-hmm. of that game in hand is against a direct rival in Coventry. It's it's almost not quite back in your hands, but you know, you've got you you've, you've fought yourself back into it by hook or by crook. Now you've got mm-hmm. an opportunity. Don't you know, chuck it away. But they're only going to do this by winning matches. You know, a point mm-hmm. to Cardiff is of no use. You know, you may as well. You know, it's it's one of those where you know, ninetieth minute, you won all. You may as well chuck Ryan Orsop up again as try because yeah. a point at this stage of the season of, is is absolutely of no use now. Um, they are in, as Burgess says, they are in the last chance saloon for winning matches. Um, I know we're running out of time. Um, I wanted to raise uh, J- just a, a touch on Jaden's form because, Fletch, you, you you said something interesting there that I think he's had 30 shots now without scoring. Mm. Some some fans were unhappy at Ellen Road that he, well, the, the, the rest of the players and the staff were, were applauding the, uh, the 3,000 away fans in the John Charles stand. Jaden... Um, Two it off down the tunnel with no acknowledgement. So I think, you know, I've been in away ends when that has happened before, and that is quite annoying, particularly after you've lost. What you've watched a lot of him recently, like I have. What what have you made of, of Jaden's performances, both for um, attacking and defensively, Fletch? I think, I think that as I said before, I think that he will be frustrated with himself that he hasn't taken these chances, and it comes with experience. It could like. This is his third season now, I think, in the championship. And his previous seasons played in different tactical systems, not been able to get as much product, this, that, and the other. But at the end of the day, you know he's got the confidence and the ability because look at the trickery that he does with his feet. So he's he's buoyed by his back's his own ability. Is he over egging the pudding sometimes? Sometimes, yes. Is he just sometimes tactically outplayed by two, a full-back and a centre-half or a centre-mid dropping back in and making it 2v1 that we've seen so many times before. That as well. But he, even if he does make a little mistake, and other players make mistakes as well, we can't just you know single out Jaden on that. He is a player who is digging in as a winger to try and get back defensively. He's someone who will, you know, he is doing it for the shirt. And he might have just gone down the tunnel last night because he was so frustrated at what's happened on the pitch. People behave in different ways emotively for certain situations. I was kicking bottles about the place last night after a 3 1, and we played yeah, well. Really the bloody face. <laughs> That's why it. you've got a lovely red conquer. But it's <laughs> but, the red you know, wine. <laughs> but um, no, we all behave differently in certain situations. He might have just, it might literally just be a case of he was so frustrated, he just wanted to get in the tunnel, get, get the dressing down, get on with it. And know. he wasn't Ellen Road. Yeah, I, 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 I wouldn't let that be a sideshow and a distraction to, to, the, to the real question, which is what's happened to his form. Prutz? I mean, since he's come back from his injury, has he been? He's shown flashes of that early season form, hasn't he? He's not attained. But then broadly, the, the team as well hasn't really kind of hit. It straps from from when we've really seen them at their absolute best. I think there's a lot of responsibility on him, which is absolutely right. It's part and parcel of being a creative player. Um, and it, I, I go back to what I said about Somerville about affecting games. We we spoke right before the game where there's so much to like about Jade and there's so much that he can do with a football that is is exciting and, and creative. They're just not seeing enough of it. Whether that's whether that's if he's getting enough of the ball, I don't know. You, um, Fletcher mentioned all those shots that he's had. I mean, you, you, to to really work out the validity of that number versus the goals that he scored, you would have to look at the, the size of the chance, the size of the opportunity, the the position on the p- pitch where the shots were being taken from, the number of players around him, and I know that I mean that that then takes us into statistics, which are. 
for mine's greater than mine. Um, but I think that, like you said, there's a genuine um, application from the player. I think there always has been to go backwards and to go forwards, to be able to kind of do as much as he possibly can for the team. I just think he's, he's searching for his for his very very best sparkling form. Whether that comes in the in the form of a lucky goal, which gets him up and running again, I don't know. But like I said, I, there's not. I don't think he's trying too hard. I think he's doing absolutely all he can to be able to get the best out of himself. I just think collectively they're not they're not at the level, and that's something that they've got to look at as individual players and as um, and as a collective. And just to finish off on on the bit about not acknowledging the fans, I mean it can be a bit of a bear pit. Ellen Road, if you are uh, an away player, and given obviously the proximity of the fans to that back of the goal and how um, animated that can be, um, I, I could potentially mitigate for him just jogging down the tunnel, but I'm not. You just stand there, you clap, you wave, you take whether someone's waving at you, sticking two fingers up at you, sorry, you just do. And whether he's young, whatever rubbish you acknowledge the fans that have traveled and paid a lot of money to watch you run around and not win a football match good bad or indifferent a fitting way to a good place to end that that's i think so yeah thank you everybody for listening for watching apologies if we didn't get to your uh question but i know there were so many that came in and we've tried to cover uh you know we, we've covered an awful lot on the latest episode fingers crossed that when we meet again next week we'll have a win to talk about because it's really hard to keep drumming up um, excitement and positives and stuff when you keep losing matches or, or certainly you don't win matches. So um, fingers crossed that we'll all go down to South Wales. If you are travelling down there, um, safe travels because it is a heck of a long way and it's not cheap, as Pru just alluded to. A um, couple of housekeeping points. Uh, Jacob Greaves will be back for the weekend. That's his two-game suspension done with and he was certainly missed over Easter. Uh, Louis Coyle and Ryan Giles both went off injured. G Giles with a thigh um, and Coyle with a back injury. We are with Liam at the training ground on Thursday, so we'll get an injury update. Hope injury update. Hopefully, there's nothing serious and they'll be involved. Um, and that's that. That's probably just about it. Burnsy, thank you for your time. Cheers, everybody. Prutz, appreciate you uh, you hot footing it back from Sky Studios to, to spend. It's your nothing less than a pleasure, gents, as ever. And you Fletch, need to get out more I'll see you. <laughs> yeah and Fletch I'll see you down in, um, in in South Wales no worries more numbers to try and create more optimism you, you, <laughs> you keep doing that. thank you for, thanks everybody <laughs> keep getting in touch at the 1904 Club on Twitter and we will be back after the game at Cardiff when hopefully City have returned to winning ways and the playoff dream is back on